And of course, we saw the uh, Google server. This is another, we call it a router today. This is an interface message processor. And this is what really started the ARPANET. And the ARPANET, of course, eventually evolved into the internet as we know it today. So this is actually just a standard Honeywell 516 that was connected to a computer that was allowed to connect up. So there were about, I think there were 12 nodes of the ARPANET that actually used one of these. But this is really the start of the internet, was right here. I'll also point out this machine right here. This is called the Sigma 5 by a Xerox Data Systems, and this is the longest continuously running computer I know of. This started operation in 1970 and was in continuous use until 2001. So, you know, for 31 years, this is in operation, which is, you know, incredible by today's standard. This is another machine that was on the early days of the ARPANET at CMU. You can see, Digital Equipment Corporation was the founder of the museum, so they gave us pretty much all of their historical stuff. And right over here, you can see our faxes and uh, PDP-11s, and these were what, you know, a large amount of the computing world was using in the 19 late 60s, early 70s, to up through the early 80s. Right here, one of my personal favorites. This is called the Galaxy Game. This is the first video game. And this is actually designed 1971 and was actually installed at Stanford's Tresseter Union. And this is the first point-operated video game. It had a PDP-1120 inside, so it would have cost about 25 grand to buy one of these. So they never really sold any, but they did make a few. And this one actually still works. And in 2002, we had a lecture here with the uh, gentleman who built this, Bill Pitts, uh, the guy who invented the game Space War, which is arguably the first computer video game, uh, Steve Russell, who lives locally, and Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, all got together. And uh, the three of them were playing here, and I was the fourth, and I won. So way to go, me. But a really impressive machine. The fact that it still works is incredible. And, you know, this actually same game concept was actually used by Nolan Bushnell in his first video game called Computer Space, right here. And this is actually somewhat of a failure. It only sold about 2,000 units. But Nolan had some friends, had some extra money, and they designed this game called Pong. That was a gentleman named Al Alcorn. And Pong really revolutionized the arcade world. And they found a company called Atari. And Atari, of course, made the most famous uh, video game console, probably of all time, the Atari 2600, and that one's from my collection. And the 2600 really changed the way that video games were done. Originally, video games were all just hard program, one or two games in a in a console. Well, here with the removable carts, that really you know changed, and that had been done with one or two machines before, but this was really to a whole nother level. It was also the largest user of microprocessors up through 1980. Show a couple of the uh, supercomputers. This one here is called the Cray-1. This is one of the machines you think of when you think of supercomputing in the 1970s. And this is the fastest machine in the world when it was released. And what's incredible about it is, one, all that wiring is done by hand. And the story goes that it was only done by Scandinavian women with needlepoint experience. Uh, Seymour Cray insisted that that was the only people who would wire his machines. Uh, you can see this little thing that sort of looks like a, uh, a bench or something. That is intended to be a bench. Um, it sort of has the nickname of the world's most expensive love seat. And one of the reasons why it's there is that the designers figured, well, you know, researchers and uh, technicians would be spending hours upon hours working on this machine. So when they have a place to sit down, you know, have a Coke, so on and so forth. Um, and there's actually this great photo in the collection of a janitor conked out asleep on this. <laughs> and that there's probably a nice place to get a nap because all the power supplies were under there, so it'd be warm and slightly buzzing. So I'd probably keep you nice and cozy. <laughs> we'll go this way, look at a couple of little things. We actually have a decent little collection of robots. So this is one of the first robotic arms called the Rancho Arm from 1962 at Rancho Los Amigos Hospital down in, down in California. And this was given to Stanford and they used it for years and years in doing all sorts of research. This is another little amazing thing here. This is a Dover laser printer. And this is the first laser printer. This is basically based on a uh, Xerox photocopier of the mid-1970s, only with a laser engine installed. You can see it's got all the stuff. And by having all the paper handling possibilities of a photocopier, they had amazing speed on this. This could print 50 pages a minute back in 1978. So, you know, nothing today comes that close. 
on the commercial level. Unfortunately, they never found a way to market this, so it never really came to market. Uh, this is a machine called that French Telecom released called the Minitel, and it is a, a terminal that for a network that the French use to replace all of their phone books. To uh, you know, you can make dinner reservations through it. It was a really impressive system. It also kept the French from getting into the internet as quickly as the rest of the world because this network was so successful. Over here, sort of the start of the micro revolution, and right here, this is a machine called the Apple One, and the Apple One was designed by Steve Wozniak and funded by Steve Jobs, and it's an incredible little system, uh, but when you bought it, all you got was the board, a bag of parts, and a manual, and you had to put it together yourself, you had to supply a case, you had to supply a uh, power supply, everything was all built by you. So, you know, this is really the start of computing as, as you know, home computing, and really within five years, there was such an explosion, that was 1976, there was such an explosion, and in 1981, all the rules were changed when the IBM PC came out, and companies loved it because it had the IBM name, uh, there were tons of software for it, and other companies like Compaq, most notably, started releasing uh, IBM compatible, so there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possible things. You could buy the same software and run it on your IBM your compact, any of these systems. And it wasn't until the mid-80s and the Macintosh that things changed again, and this is the introduction of the graphical user interface. And of course, Windows came out of that as well, Microsoft, you know, wanting to combat that. So this is, you know, really the, the change that was happening was right here in 1984. And of course, not everything in the museum is a huge success. Uh, this is the next cube, and Next was the company that Steve Jobs started after he left Apple. And Next was a really impressive machine technologically, but it sold for ten thousand dollars and had a monochromatic screen, so you didn't really get a lot of users for it. So eventually, Next unfortunately just died. But you know, it's really you know the dead ends that are sometimes most interesting, and this is an incredibly advanced operating system for its time. Well, that's all I have for you. Chris, uh, thank you for the tour. It's very enjoyable, and I hope people enjoy the show. Okay. Yeah, this is a future exhibit for the Computer History Museum. It's a timeline of the computers and how the computers will affect people in, in history. And this exhibit is uh, 14,000 square foot, and it'll also be upstairs in the Computer History Museum. It should be opening around 2009. This exhibit is also being created by the same people that created the Experience Music Project in Seattle. Okay, this is the next exhibit. There's a History of Computer Chess and Software. It's opening in the summer of 2005, which is just a few months from now. On display will also be the computer Deep Blue, which has challenged Gary Kasparov in a chess match. Mm -hmm.